one of the most unbelievable memories I have of your career. I was watching you at the Democratic National Convention. It was a crazy time. And I remember you just being on the convention floor and Cronkite, I think, threw to you, and suddenly you're in a fist fight. Well, 1968 Democratic Convention, it was a crazy time, crazy place. What was happening is that they wanted total, complete control over the convention inside. Outside, they were having a hell of a time trying to keep control. It was insane. Rioting in the streets and that sort of thing. But inside, they were determined to keep control. So the situation, very briefly, was a delegate was being escorted. He was being hustled out of the hall by people who were dressed in civilian clothes, not policemen. Right. So I'm a floor reporter. I see a delegate. The guys have him by the arm and are trying to hustle him out. He's got a big delegate badge on. This is the story. So I s attempted to put the microphone and saying, sir, what's going on here? Security people block it aside. I try naturally position myself in front so they have to run over me to get to me. The security guy uh, hit me in the solar plexus, practically knocked me out. Wow. It knocked me to the floor because they wanted to get him off the floor because as soon as they get outside that floor perimeter, I, as a correspondent, can't go past that perimeter. So the idea was to get him outside the perimeter. So let me ask you something. Do you realize in that moment, oh, my God, I've got great television going on here? No. You don't? Didn't enter my head. Didn't enter my head. Were you afraid you could get killed? No, I wasn't afraid to get killed. I, I, I'd already absorbed a pretty, <laughs> pretty tough punch. But here's what happens, Howard. If you're any good as a reporter, nothing matters but the story. You get so laser beam focused. It's what tennis players call zoned on the story. You're not thinking about television. You're, th you're only thinking about the story. Now, in the minutes, certainly the hours afterward, you say, wow, they got that on live television? can't believe it. Do I'm people start calling you up and congratulating you at CBS News? Are they like, wow, man, you just did it. You just made great television. <laughs> no. They don't. N nobody, nobody said any, any such thing. I think everybody was kind of stunned. Uh, but yeah. afterwards, when you analyze it, do you sit there and go, you know what? These sons of bitches are going to notice me now. <laughs> I'm in line to get this anchor job. <laughs> no, you I know? didn't think about that then. Really? I, 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 I can say truthfully, I did not think about it. I didn't think about the anchor job until late in the 1970s. But here's the question I want to make sure I ask you before this is all over. So when you're in Afghanistan and you're risking your life, and you're in Vietnam and you're l risking your life, but then you compare it to the stories you covered in, co in this country, like the Civil Rights Movement, where you'd go down south, you're covering Martin Luther King and the whole movement, some hillbilly clans guy sticks a gun to your head, right? You've had that happen. You've had a gun yes. to your head, and they try to threaten you, right? right? What did the guy say to you when he put a gun to your head? Well, the quote was, uh, I'm going to fucking kill you. With a gun to your head? Yeah. You had to be scared? You bet. So was it, in a sense, more dangerous working in this country or working overseas? And I think the answer is this country, right? Well, certainly as dangerous, that situation. Mind you, fortunately for me, the light man had his own gun, if you remember. He, then yep. he put the gun to the, uh, to the gun wielders. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, but that's, look, there's no denying it. That was, that was dangerous stuff. Did you think he was going to shoot you? I thought he might. Uh, do, uh, do you, does your whole life start to go in front of you? Do you start to think about the kids and your wife, and you start to go, man, I, I, I probably I was going to be the anchor man one day. <laughs> 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 well, that's true. Your life goes, whether it's Afghanistan it or the Deep South, all of a sudden it's flashing in front of you. Wife, kids, life, what might be. See, in, in my eyes, that's why you were a successful anchorman. You had lived all those experiences. I don't think guys today, a lot of anchor guys are specifically trained as actors That's to read the news. They're, they've never really covered a story. They've never risked their lives. True? That's true in many cases. Not always their fault. And, and not only do I think they miss something uh, as performers, as people who can get the ratings or demographics, but they're missing a lot of adventure in their life. I mean, I won't kid you. I've lived the journalism of joy. I, I, I love doing it. I have a passion doing it. But Howard, this, you've hit on something very important that I think the audience recognizes. If you burn with a hot, hard flame for news, and news is what your life is about, not the makeup, not the lights, not being in the studio, not being what I call a hothouse plant, the audience will recognize it. But the people who hire anchor people don't believe that.